Hello, everyone. Happy Essex and Phil Day. <laughs> How are you? We are going live to celebrate the legacy of Essex and Phil. I'm Charles Stevens, and I'm the executive director of the Counter Narrative Project. And my name is Johnny Cornegay, and I'm the mobilization and network director for the Counter Narrative Project. Okay. I'm not, what am I supposed to be looking at? Which um, camera? That, that's the camera. <laughs> <up there. laughs> Forgive me. Um, who do we have on? Who do we have on? Let's see. Who do we have in the room? Let's do a roll call. Let's see. Hey, Marcus Stanley. Marcus Stanley is with us. So we're also doing a Twitter chat. So this is an interesting experiment. <laughs> right. Because we're like both doing a Twitter chat and also a Facebook Live at the same time. So you're going to witness us doing this Facebook Live. I mean, doing a Twitter chat. We just really wanted to have a space to discuss a 6 and Phil. Um, and I don't know. We're really excited. Like we've been planning this for about a month or so, right? Yeah. And every year that I know since I've founded Counter Narrative Project actually four years ago this month, it was really important for us to bring the ancestors into this organization right. constantly. You know, as I always say, you know, we stand on their shoulders. Like the Counter Narrative Project is very much in their tradition. I just welcome people on Twitter. Um, so if you want to try this weird experiment yeah. with us, try to also see if you can both be on Twitter and on Facebook Live at the same time. Absolutely. And please um, use the hashtag... Um, happy birthday, Essex. So if you do decide to, um, you know, post messages on Facebook as well, I know that some people do prefer to do that. Um, go ahead and use the hashtag happy birthday, Essex. And of course, you can join us on Twitter and do the same thing. Um, but uh, to Charles's point, uh, always happy to celebrate um, Essex and Phil and um, his revolutionary work and looking forward to having some discussions with all of you about how Essex um, has impacted you. And even um, for those of you that aren't as familiar with Essex and Phil's work, um, I'm hoping that you really get a chance to be inspired by this conversation as well. Yes. I see Nathan Townsend has joined us. Hey, Nathan. So also in the comments, let's have a discussion, you know, even though we're kind of in two places that what we're shapeshifters. Right. <laughs> um, please join us in the comments as well. Looks like our Twitter chat is already kind of getting rocking. Um, and this is really exciting um, with folks joining us. So we also have like, Johnny brought like all the Essex and Phil books. So we have, is it showing? Yeah, this, uh, that should be showing, yeah, that should be showing up there. Let me let me double check and make sure. That is in fact on the screen. Yes, people can see that. We have uh, Ceremonies, <laughs> um, which is like my favorite. You got the like, the more recent one. There was like an original mm -hmm. one. Johnny also has, Brother to Brother that he brought. How many of y'all have read Brother to Brother? Um, did I tell you that? Like when I was, when I first came, okay, when I first decided to come out, come out, um, Brother to Brother was like my Bible. Like it really held me as mm -hmm. I was going through that journey. And I remember reading the the introduction that Essex Nunfield wrote like so many years ago. Um, like I, it was really dramatic. So I, I went to the park and I was in my thoughts and I was like, what does it mean for me to be out? And is this the right thing? And I started reading um, brother to brother, you know, it's so powerful. Hey, Art Jackson, I see Art has joined us. Um, Johnny also has Tongues Untied. Yes. This is the anthology Tongues Untied, not the not the documentary right. that we all know, but this is the, top, the, the 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 anthology that came out years before the actual film. I mean, it's not related to this is different than Marlon Riggs Project. This is um, a, a whole other work. I, I believe that. I mean, I'm imagining the title of this anthology inspired the film. Um, but there were some amazing Essexes in here and Craig Harris and many others. And there's uh, Life Sentences, which Essex has one of my favorite poems of his, yeah. Vital Signs, anthologized in there as well. Hey, Art. So please, in the comments, you know, share your experiences with Essex. Like, join along with us. How did you find Essex? You know, it's interesting. So Charles mentioned, um, you know, Life Sentences, which includes Vital Signs. One of the most um, fascinating things for me, so I was introduced to Vital Signs actually through Charles mm -hmm. um, and uh, did not realize until I actually picked up life sentences and understood that it was a multi-part yeah. piece oh, that yeah. was so multifaceted and covered so much of Essex, Essex's life. So it includes 
poetry as well as um, an essay, um, which is written in this written in this beautiful kind of poetic way. Um, and it really does ground you in this in this fact that you know Essex had um, such a tremendous way of communicating to folks um, some of the most challenging things. And I know that as we get into the Twitter chat, um, I'll certainly bring to Facebook Live some some uh, words from Essex that were really powerful to me. I see some of our Twitter panelists are, are already reaching out. Yeah. <laughs> Telling them to use the hashtag happy birthday Essex. Happy birthday Essex, please use that hashtag. Oh, Carrie Still. Yeah, so Anthony Mackie starred in this film called Brother to Brother, which was really interesting. It was an interesting film. Oh, yes. Did you see it? Hey, Brother to Brother, that was actually one of the earlier films that I saw that had um, a black gay theme. It yeah. was one of the first films that I remember seeing. And Absolutely. And it was a really cool juxtaposition of a contemporary Black gay man's mm -hmm. experience with the Harlem Renaissance yep. and kind of what they were experiencing. So it was a really, really powerful film. Came out, I guess, in the early aughts. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually more like 2005, six or so. Um, but just a really great film. Carrie, did you see, what did you think of, what did you think of the film, uh, Brother to Brother, Carrie? Let me see here. Hey there. Okay, people are checking in on the um, Twitter, yeah, how's our Twitter chat. Looking? Let me say hey to Joe. Joe just checked in. So while Johnny's venturing over to Twitter, I'll keep talking. Um, so what are your favorite, some of your favorite Essex Hemphill poems? Um, I know for me, I can say, um, and many of them are ceremonies actually. Um, I love Heavy Corners. Um, I love uh, Now We Think, which is also Ooh, in Tom's yes. Inside, right? Yes. Um, there's Object Lessons, which we excerpted uh, from for one of our memes. Mm -hmm. And even his essays, uh, Essex and Phil's essays are really powerful. So I mean, I've said again and again, um, for me, uh, Essex and Phil's work has just been such an important part of my development as a Black gay man. It's been an important part of my activism work. It's an important part of my work as a writer. You know, and I've been really communing with Essex Hemphill since I was like a kid, essentially, like just for over 20 years almost. Um, so it's just really, really just an important person. Also, for other folks, Michael, Ward Michael, how you got Michael Ward? Now, how you gonna be on the Twitter chat and the Facebook? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> hey, Maurice Franklin. How you doing, Maurice? Oh my God, I have to give a shout out to Maurice because Maurice Franklin, I hope he doesn't feel weird, but. Marius has taught me so much about that generation. Uh, Marius is also very much a part of that, you know, the, what I call the great, the great generation, mm -hmm. the generation 1986. But Marius and so many um, of my big brothers have just taught me so much about Essex and Marlon Riggs and the people on this t-shirt, obviously. <laughs> and I'm so grateful for Marius and just the, like the lessons that they've instilled in us. Um, Marius says he likes Now We Think. Marius Franklin says he likes Now We Think as We. But, oh, yeah, he's, like, commenting. <laughs> and, and I yeah. think, Carrie, you know what's so interesting? First of all, we forget the importance of BET, I think, in the, in the you know, 80s and 90s. Carrie, I love your comment there of, you know, the first time you ever hearing of or seeing Essex was on Our Voices with Bev Smith. You know, um, what? Yeah, he was that was the, he. Apparently, he was on there. Oh, wow. I was. I. I really. And you know what? We probably should do a search if there's anyone out there that might have like a VHS tape of that, that oh, would be wow. amazing That's to cool. see. Um, because we, you know, seeing that uh, would have just been life changing for me. I actually um, came to know Essex um, in 1997. Mm -hmm. Um, and I actually wrote a letter to Essex today on Instagram, um, but I came to wow. to become familiar in 1997. And it was just, I was 20 mm -hmm. and I was just like confused. Wow. And um, undressing icon. So it was early, you know, I found undressing icon. Somebody had <laughs> posted that essay really? somewhere on the internet. And uh -huh. I said, who is this person um, speaking to me? And then that's how, that's what led me to ceremony. Mm. Um, but it was it was through that essay. Oh wow! Um, Kevin Tarver, who's on our Twitter chat, one of our Twitter panelists, uh, tweeted out the essay he wrote for us um, for our brother Essex. Yeah. Um, and he'll say, I'll, "I'll never forget this event celebrating Essex and Phil. The other men showed me the power of community." Absolutely, I think as 
Black gay men and allies, I think, or really the Black LGBTQ community in general, um, we built so much community around like the arts and poetry, mm-hmm. certainly at Six and Phil. Yes. Um, there's so much community. And I think it just speaks to the power of art and stories mm-hmm. where we're able to build community and have sacred space with each other. Absolutely. So our Twitter is, is jumping. It's popping. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm doing some refreshing here. Jer- Jericho Brown let us know he's getting off the plane, but he's checking in. <laughs> hey, Jericho. Jericho, the amazing, amazing poet, professor. <laughs> um, I know that, you know, I just mentioned Undressing Icons, and I'm just going to, um, so because we have these books here, I, you know, I thought um, I certainly wanted to jump in, because there was um, one of the things that really stuck out to me and I needed to learn was, like, who who were my people? Because I was having mm-hmm. all these thoughts and I was confused. And um, I remember Essex asking these questions, and this is what kind of led me to uh, more of his work, but uh, the questions were, who has access to Black history? Yeah. Who is allowed to examine it and interpret it? And who decides what can and cannot be discussed? Mm-hmm. Um, and, what, you know, and in this piece, um, Essex was talking about, specifically about um, the controversy around um, Isaac Julian's looking for Langston. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember feeling like there was always difficulty with um, dealing with complexity of some of our our people that we hold in high esteem. Yes, and so this really spoke to me uh, for being able to really see our people mm. for who our people were. Um, and Essex just had kind of a, a very magical and poetic way of discussing those types of things. Awesome. I see a few comments I want to get at. Um, and Marius, we love you too. <laughs> Um, our Twitter. So we asked on Twitter, um, how did you discover Essex and Fun? We just started mm-hmm. discussing that. Um, but yeah, in the comments on Facebook, feel free to let us know, like, how did you discover Essex and Phil and really just what he means to you? I know some of us might have known him personally, for example. Of course, yeah. I always love both stories. Mm-hmm. But yeah, just share with us, like, what, how did you find Essex and Phil? How did you find, was he, um, was there another another person in your life that shared with you an Essex and Phil book? Um, did you stumble upon his work in like a library? Did you see him on TV? Like, how did you find Essex? What was your path to Essex like? Please share with us. So I am um, inside Twitter, um, just uh, doing a making a couple of responses here because. Nice. Um, it, an interesting story about me discovering Essex too. Um, I was having a conversation with um, a longtime friend. Mm-hmm. Um, he's my oldest friend. Like I've known him since I was oh, really? sixth grade. Right? <laughs> and um, I was having a conversation with him and um, was thanking him for introducing mm-hmm. me to Essex. Oh, wow. At the time. And because, you know, sometimes we remember history differently, you know, and he was like, no, 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 no. You introduced me to Essex. And um, the beauty, though, um, that we were even able to have that exchange is because um, it was important, uh, I would imagine, important for me at the time to share with him this 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 person mm. who was walking the streets at the same time that we were alive wow. and we didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> and he was writing to he was writing for us and to us. Um, so it was an interesting piece of history that I miss remembered mm. and he helped me to correct um but i know so many other folks that got introduced to essex through other people that's incredible we have a few comments on twitter thank you for sharing that no, no problem. um jr says i was watching the screening of tongues untied he's featured throughout it but there are specific scene in the bar that made me want to know specifically who he was mm. so jr the literary matter the literary masturbator <laughs> was sharing that uh he met um, S- or he discovered S60 times of time. I think that's the case for many of us. Mark shares that I discovered Essex after I came out in 2014 and was looking for black literary gay writers to study. I really dig, I really dug in once I realized that his poetry was prophetic and touched on current issues of today. Absolutely, Essex and Phil was a prophet in so many ways, yes. a prophetic poet. I mean, the reason why I believe his work is so relevant still today is that it's timeless in a sense. Absolutely. Um, and at the same time, I think perhaps he might have even anticipated some of mm-hmm. what was down the road. I mean, that's certainly the work of work of a poet of a poet and prophet. So thank you so much for sharing that. 
I'm curious to know, um, are there folks um, when, I know that when I discovered Essex, I didn't bring this, this here today, but um, I began um, my coming out journey through writing poetry oh, wow. after discovering Essex. Wow. And I have um, sitting in my studio right now <laughs> is the book. It's the only poetry book I kept from my years of writing poetry. And it's from the 19, my 1997 um, kind of coming out year. 97. Huh? 1997. Wow. My coming out year. And it's called Bliss. Like it's written Bliss. in the front. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, but I started to write, so I was able to work through all of my feelings and my thoughts through words, but that idea was inspired by Essex. So I'm curious to know, um, are there folks out there that were inspired to write to write because poetry. of him? Because mm. um, I know that he definitely did. It was a period for me that I really needed. Wow. Um, <laughs> and Essex was the, the catalyst. For I think Essex had the opposite effect of me where reading his poetry made me feel like I shouldn't even bother. <laughs> I, just, I don't have any business writing poetry. Um, hey, Chris. Christopher Bartlett is here representing Philadelphia's hey, in the house. Philly. <laughs> um, Christopher is also, Chris is also an amazing, Chris Bartlett um, is such an amazing, amazing soul. Um, definitely one of the leaders I look to um, just around being great at using the arts and culture mm -hmm. in building community and in leadership and, and really in the HIV movement. Um, there aren't many of us cultural workers or cultural organizers that are in the HIV movement right now, I don't think. Um, and so I have to find inspiration right. uh, in, other, in many places. And Chris is one of those figures. So thank you. Um, one of the, this is just a, uh, it's beautiful to see. Um, uh, Joe T on uh, Twitter is um, posting these uh, amazing portraits. So Rotimi Fani Coyote took these uh, beautiful portraits um, of Essex and Dennis Carney um, back in London. And he's posting some of these beautiful images um, that Essex was a part of. And if, and if you've probably seen our, our social media today, just seeing some of the striking images that were captured of Essex over the years, um, in a variety of different moods. Um, so it was not only, you know, through his writing that he was able to communicate mm -hmm. um, feeling and depth. It was really through um, visuals. Um, and he was really able to do that. Awesome. At Jatella, I've uh, shared on Twitter that Marlon Riggs introduced me to Essex Hemphill. I read the ending credits, wherein I discovered that most of the poems were written by Essex Hemphill. I immediately began my Google search and the rest of this queer story. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of us discovered Essex Hemphill through um, Kongs and Tide. And what I also love about Kongs and Tide was this amazing collaboration of, of Black A artists. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, Marlon Riggs, who's like this filmmaker, mm -hmm. and then you have Essex Hemphill's poetry, and others, Craig mm -hmm. G. Harris has, um, you know, his work is in there. Um, Joseph Beam's amazing, you know, Black Men Loving Black Men is it's a revolutionary a act in the that comes up in, in the film Songs and Tide, you know, comes from uh, In the Life, Joseph Beam's In the Life. And, you know, Marlon, ex, you know, uh, lifts, takes that quote from out of In the Life and puts it in Songs and Tide. It's actually one of the most, like, gorgeous moments in the film when it, Black Men Loving yes. Black Men, to see it, I mean, it's one thing to say it, but to see it across the screen mm -hmm. is such a, I mean, to put Black and gay and revolutionary in the same sentence is right. such a powerful, powerful moment. And I think it's part of the magic of Tongues Untied. Um, Maris shares on Facebook that Essex writing inspired sexual liberation. Yes, yes, yes. Indeed. Essex definitely <laughs> um, was in so many ways a, a very, there's just like a very liberated, sexually liberated spirit in his writing. He wrote candidly, but beautifully about intimacy and touch and pain. And all those things relate to the sexuality between us and um, just such a, like, you know, even romantic love, you mm -hmm. know, certainly Black Beans is, you know, one of the poems where he kind of gets into that. Um, so, yeah, please continue sh to share some of your favorite works or even lines from Essex and Phil's works. Absolutely. And I wanted to, um, now we think, uh, so <laughs> um, in, in 2016, a counter narrative project did um, our celebration of Essex and Phil on his birthday that yes. year too. And um, we opened the space with Now We Think. Um, and it was my first time actually, um, I'd read the piece many times and I'm in love with the piece because it appears in Tongues Untied in that very poetic way where we had the, 
you know, the now we think is we fuck kind of happening under in the undertone. Um, but reading that piece and opening that space with now we think really um, prepared people for the power of Essis's words um, and his ability to communicate not just um, sex and sexuality, but um, our 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 moment um, as black gay men and in, in, in focus. Joe shares. Um in relation to how you find uh, the Essex show uh, to show me myself, I felt so seen when reading him as an early 20 something. And I think, you know, for many of us that aren't in places where we have a, a large black community, you know, our black community, you know, are our, our, our authors, especially, yeah. you know, in sort of like the nineties, um, you know, those of us that kind of grew up like, uh, especially like generation Xers, I suppose mm-hmm. um, many of us found community through the books that we're reading. Yep. So Essex and Phil and, Joseph Beam and, you know, even Elon Harris and like uh-huh. just so many writers, like that whole, like I think about the 90s especially, like I think a lot of us were able to find community through the books that we're reading. And I think that's a, a, a really important thing. I mean, how many of us had the experience of having, well, I think the sort of older generation maybe having James Baldwin books that they kind of hid under their bed. Right. <laughs> took out to read. Um, I think for some of the later, you know, might have been like Elon Harris or uh-huh. James L. Hardy. But I mean, I think that there's just such an important part, which I, I mean, obviously might not be the case so much now um, because of, you know, technology and such. But uh, yeah, it's an important, important, important experience. Uh, someone just shouted us out um, saying that they learned about someone new to me today. I suggest you learn more too. Um, I guess they learned about Essex and Phil. Um, Mark responds, uh, some of his favorites are on Twitter. Some of his favorites are Now We Think, his name was Mandingo, yes. Ceremonies, If Freud Had Been an Erotic Colored Woman. You remember that? If Freud Had Been a, about I Francis did, Yeah, Francis yeah, Wilson. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's so funny. So when I, you know, when I was a freshman at Morehouse, I took a black psychology class. Okay. And in the class, we were introduced to Francis Cress Wilson, who was like this um, psychiatrist. And she. Uh, among her many views, uh, she definitely, you know, had a lot of, you know, homophobic views, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. And so um, Essex wrote this essay, <laughs> like responding to her work. And, it, and, that, and it was, it's so, so I was in the class, I was reading the essay at the same time. Right. It was really, really amazing. Um, but Mark goes on to Tomb of Sorrow and his contributions in Songs and Tide and Look. Oh, Looking for Langston. Have y'all seen Looking for Langston? Essex Simple's works also are in that a part of that mm-hmm. movie too. I don't know if y'all had a chance to see that um, by Isaac Julian. And you, um, fortunately, you can find Looking for Langston online. Um, it, it is available. So if you do do a Google search, um, you can find um, a digital way to be able mm-hmm. to rent that film. So um, it is uh, absolutely available um, to you. Kevin Tarver says, uh, For Mountain Protection is my jam. What I love about <laughs> Essex pieces is that they are timeless, this piece gets me every time. I mean, and so many, you know, he called it his jam, but I mean, you think about it, I mean, I feel like, you know, Essex Hemphill's poetry really, really is like the soundtrack to our movement. Mm-hmm. Like, if poetry can be like a soundtrack or an anthology can be a soundtrack, I mean, I, I absolutely think that um, Hemphill's poems, you know, are like that, especially yep. for me. Yeah, there's, um, and I, I pulled um, one of the pieces um, that's one of my, um, pieces that I love, the father, the, the father, son, and unholy ghost. Essex had this really, um, uh, I love the way he talked about his relationship um, with his, his father, because um, it happens in Vital Signs and it happens um, here in this piece. And there's a section four um, of this, and I, I love it. I circle questions of blood. I give a fierce fire dance. The flames call me. It's, it is safe. I leap. Unprepared to be brave, I surrender, more frightened of being alone. I have to do this to stay alive, to be acknowledged. Fire calls, I slither to the frame, to the flames, to be cumbered. Mm, I mean, Carrie still shared that, um, I guess, uh, exerting from an Essex and Phil piece, uh, living the word, looking for home. Of your Lord said something to me that has continued even now to inform me. She made it very clear that none of us comes with our consciousness fully developed. It is a constant work that we have to be ever vigilant about. I'm counseling myself these days around patience. I'm counseling myself around understanding that we come to issues not only from different sites of experiences, but with different levels of consciousness. 
so as not to be so quick, not to be judgmental, not to be so rapid around closing the door, around writing someone off. That's absolutely amazing. I mean, and I, there's so much to say also about the influence of Audre Lorde mm-hmm. on Essex and on Essex and Phil, on Craig Harris, on Joseph Beam. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's this incredible, really influence of, of black lesbian feminism yes. on, on that generation of black gay men and their analysis, their political analysis really developed from being in conversation with Barbara Smith, with Audre Lorde, with Cheryl Clark, with, you know, um, and, and to that extent, I think we have a lot to learn even today about how we do um, multi-gender organizing. Quite Absolutely. Frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, um, in, you know, in particular, I was I was um, introduced, you know, through our conversation, um, you know, about, you know, the letters, um, Joseph Beam's letters and, and these conversations that were taking place. And, and keep in mind that, you know, folks, you know, at this time were having these conversations through letter. You yes. know, and having these these discussions and having to mail it and send it to a person <laughs> and, and sit with it yeah. and really begin to build. And I think that certainly I know that in our current political moment, which is one of the questions we just asked on Twitter, in our current political moment, it's incredibly important for us to um, when we talk about intersectionality and being together, like we have to talk to one another absolutely, and really talk to one another. So it's not just a matter of showing up. To, to, to just support. I mean, that's great, but talk about what's going on because mm. guess what? There's a lot of overlap. Mm, absolutely. You know, um, and we can get a lot done. Um, so our question on Twitter um, that we just asked was, you know, how do you think Essex and Phil influenced our current political moment? Uh, can we go back to like the question too? Uh, mm-hmm. There were a few more things I wanted to get before yeah. we went to that. Um, what are some of your favorite works by him, Phil? Um, Mark says, whenever I see or hear Essex perform, now we think it's so goddamn powerful on so many emotional <laughs> levels. Uh, absolutely. Um, Jer says, agreed, it's so visceral and organic, the kind of thing that hits you in your solar plexus. Oof. I know, right? It does. It's like the words aren't just hurt with their experience. Mm-hmm. It's like there's something that Essex was able to tap into on a, pro- on a almost like a primal level. Mm-hmm. I mean, he understood just really how to, how to, move, the, how to move the soul almost. Like he can just really to speak to our deepest desires, yeah. you know, our deepest fears. And I think that's what part of what I think makes his, his work so beautiful. Um, so you want to go to the political Absolutely. current moment question? Let me see. So, um, yes, in our current political. So the question um, is, how do you think Essex Hemphill influenced our um, current political moment? Um, you know, I look at for my own protection as like... <laughs> The, the the blueprint for her yes. kind of uh, 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 to guide us through um, what we're experiencing currently. Um, that particular piece speaks to that importance of, you know, needing to be together mm-hmm. um, and needing one another to be able to um, defeat whatever challenges come our way. Um, so I really do think he provided some really key blueprints and I do think for my own protection is, is key in that. Yeah, I mean, I felt like that poem, because it's such like an, an anthem for us in so many mm-hmm. ways. I mean, I've seen it have life, not just in you know the academic context or even a literary context, but also in community-based organizations. Mm-hmm. I, I used to run a program at Aid Atlanta many, many years ago called Deeper Love. Yeah. And when we would open our retreats, you know, we do these retreats we'd open our treats with from our own protection of really just kind of like bring the sacredness of the, of the poem to the space. Mm-hmm. And amazingly, it, every time we read the poem and sometimes we do it like orally, like we'd all read it together. Mm-hmm. So picture, you know, 25, 30 black men reading from our own protection together in the woods at a retreat. Right. I mean, it was just, it was incredible. I see response. I see a few responses I want to get to. Um, Jer shares, I would think by his work being of his time period, so much. Oh no, I lost the text. Oh, here it is. I lost, right the, here. I lost the thing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would think by his working, I would think, I would think by his work being of his time period, so much of it was about what he was going through at the time, thinking and feeling. It shows how important it is to reflect that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, I think the challenge for writers is not just 
to write for the moment you're in, but also to write for the future. Because, right. you know, in a sense, I mean, writing can be timeless, as we've seen so many times before. What else do we have on Twitter? Let's see what's happening on Twitter. <laughs> Kevin Tarver says, yes. <laughs> Uh, I take that as a, a, a affirmative. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to shout out a few more folks, a few more things. I think there's a lot of people loving Now We Think. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. So Michael Ward chimed in to, I guess, how he found Essex. Uh, Michael Ward says, and hey, Michael Ward, thank you for being on our Twitter chat. (laughs) Through the work of Joseph Beam and Marla Riggs, I wanted to read as many Black gay experiences as possible. Absolutely. I mean, I think we've used, we've called, especially in the life, the anthology in the life, but a lot of those books really were like our blueprints for so many of us that were trying to figure out what does it mean to be Black and gay? How to experience the world? How do we navigate this journey? How do we grapple with I mean it was all in, in the life it yes. was all, you know one of the reasons why I get so frustrated with the question about you know are you black first and are you gay first I'm like they already solved that they, <laughs> like, they already it's, it's nothing to grapple with they already, right. why are we discussing it Marlon Riggs already solved it it's like you know you don't you shouldn't choose like there's no hierarchy in your identity it's like choosing between your black identity and gay identity is like choosing between your left and right eye right. as he says mm-hmm. um, and I think that that's just always something I carried with me that I don't have to rank my identities and I think Essex Hemphill, uh, especially brought, sort of um, amplified the concept through poetry, really. Absolutely. So we have another response here on um, on Twitter Mm -hmm. um, from Mark. Um, And uh, Essex's work was Mm -hmm. intersectional before it became a thing. Mm -hmm. He was not only fighting for the revolutionary act of Black men loving Black men, but for the rights of all those marginalized in a society that fears the other. He's just as relevant now as ever before. A lot of people are aghast at racism among the LGBTQ community, but if people read Essex and other works from that era, they'd see that this is just the status quo. Thank you so much. Um, That was uh, Mark on Twitter. Excellent. You know, I'm, I'm still very much haunted by... The, that amazing aphorism from Joseph Beam, Black Men Loving Black Men, is Revolutionary Act. He says of the Revolutionary Act of the 80s, but of the Revolutionary Act. And I think it's so relevant even today. Like mm-hmm. before there was Black Boy Joy, mm-hmm. you know, and all these other kinds of things. There was Black Men Loving Black Men is Revolutionary Act. And I think that it's so many ways that was the, that set the foundation. Um, for, and it's still, and it's something I think we still need to talk about today. Yes. Like the power of love between us. Yep. Um, because there's so many things in this culture that would rather us not be loving toward each other. Absolutely. Um, I completely agree. And I I look at it as like the one thing we really haven't tried. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and of course, it's aspirational, but it's also like we've done so many things. You know, there's been amazing biomedical advances that have impacted our lives. There's been, you know, uh, amazing technological advances that have impacted our lives. Um, but we still are grappling with some of the issues that Essex was talking about in the 80s and then the 90s. And when we go back to that Black men loving Black men is the revolutionary act, it's like, okay, we've tried a lot of things. Can we, we should probably really try this. Mm. And what, and let's see what that does for us. Mm. But it's such a risk, right? It's the ultimate risk to love Mm. each other because I think, you know, as black gay men, we are taught to fear each other before anything else. You know, we're taught to fear our sexuality. We're taught to fear ourselves and to deprogram ourselves enough, to decolonize ourselves enough, to be open, to to be loving and not just romantic love. Mm -hmm. Um, but just to love, I think, is such a powerful, powerful thing. It's a risk, right? Mm-hmm. It's it, I think people experience it as, as, as a risk, um, but the rewards are so great Yes. once you open up to that. I also think of many of us, we don't really know how to love each other. And I know right. that sort of sounds kind of pop psychology-ish, but, you know, where, where, as Black women, where do we get the blueprints to love each other, especially when there's so many things to tell us not to? Right. I mean, I so much of the work of the Counter Narrative Project and what the organization is founded on is wanting to 
respond to the inclination that so many of us have to like down each other, to dog mm-hmm. each other. I mean, I still hear, you know, I mean, I still hear, and I've since I've been working with black women, it's like you still hear it. It's like, oh, you know, black men ain't shit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that whole thing. And it's like, no, absolutely not. Like we're we're not doing that. <laughs> no, and um, you know, and so and at least in my in my in my personal experience, um when I've dug deeper with folks, um, so many of us have walls that we have built, walls built out of fear, walls mm-hmm. built out of um, rejection, walls built out of, you know, for, for so many reasons. And um, that, that, that um, breaking down is, is difficult. Um, and going into uh, kind of that decolonizing process, I want to, um, My, uh, Miles E. Johnson, so on the Counter Narrative Project blog, um, there's our, our newest blog is called To Be Real, which was written by Miles e. Johnson. Hey, Miles. Hey, Miles. <laughs> and um, Miles um, has a piece where he he is describing um, kind of like what he calls this decolonizing process. Right. Um, and he, he states that often domination will feed you media that tells you you do not exist and you are not good enough. The actions that are born from the uh, that belief that are seeking validation and power from the very locations that wish to annihilate and invalidate. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, so how, you know, so yeah. decolonizing from that. Kevin um, responded to the question of what are some things that HIV advocates today can take from Essex and Phil's mm-hmm. body of work? So let me repeat that question again. What are some things that HIV advocates today can take from Essex and Phil's body of work? And Kevin says, transparency, Transparency is so important in HIV advocacy. As advocates, we are sirens, and we often have to be unapologetic with it. And vulnerability is often seen as risky, but it's not. It's transformative. It's powerful. It's life-saving. Thank you, Mm. Kevin. That is absolutely brilliant. So our most recent question was about... Um, the question was, what are your thoughts about how Hemphill talked about sexuality mm-hmm. and desire? And I know uh, Mari's kind of foreshadowed that a bit earlier on in the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, but Jay responds, for me, it represents the saying what others are thinking type of thing. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if there are many writers that have been able to articulate the interior world of black gay men as well as Essex and Phil to really, you know, the narratives of black gay men, we're so often objectified by science, yes. right? So you see these endless uh, narratives about rooted in deficit and pathology about who we are to the point where we reproduce them Yes, so often. But I, I think what was most rad, one of the most radical things about Essex and Phil's project, particularly as he talked about sex and desires that he got into our, you know, our consciousness, our subjectivity, like really, Speaking, speaking in a sense uh, to our innermost thoughts, like narrating those experiences, giving our most internal thoughts and feelings, like giving, like giving it, like giving language to it. Yes, is such a powerful. And you know, I think one of the things that some of our, the greatest writers have done is be able to give us language to describe the world around us. And I think you know, oftentimes it's so easy to just take from Essex Hemphill's work to just kind of put a name and label to some of what we're feeling. And I think that was such a powerful, powerful part of his work. Um, To be able to, I remember, you know, and now we think there's this really pivotal moment where, um, where in talking about um, HIV at that time, Essex did such an amazing job of saying, we went from this period of, you know, being together and then we kind of reverted back and kind of went back Mm. into these quiet places and these silent places. (laughs) Um, We didn't stop doing and we didn't stop being together, but it became much less um, uh, free flowing. And I'm actually pulling that piece because I think it's so important to um, describing how um, how he talks about that. Um, we stop kissing tall, dark strangers, sucking mustaches, putting lips, tongues everywhere. We return to pictures, telephones, toys, mm. <laughs> recent lovers, private lives. And let's talk about this. So we live at this moment now where we have access almost 
complete access to pictures mm -hmm. at all times through telephones. Mm -hmm. So we're always able to access. Um, Except for when we delete our Jack the Count. Except for when we delete the Jack <laughs> And we're never going right. to load that Jack the Count again. We're done with Growler. Right. We're deleting the apps. We're not on the grinder anymore because they're doing too much with the grind. Until, <laughs> until, we, get back, until we get back on again. Right. <laughs> so Essex did this wonderful job of you know being able to talk about and, and seductively um, our lives um, and also the challenges of that time. Mm. To our question about how Essex influenced our current political moment, Michael says, for Black men to stand up for our issues with the LGBT community and realize that we must identify issues that, that affect us separately from other non-POC. That's absolutely true. I mean, you know, they, one of the things I loved about Essex Hemphill's work and still do is that he was so unapologetically Black. Um, <laughs> just, a, you know, I'm going to I'm going to write, you know, and I, and I feel like he was writing to us like. Yes. You know, I I'm always so in love with writers that write to black folks, mm -hmm. not just writing to, you know, and and I and I also think in the process of writing to black folks, it's not, it's not that other people can't take right. something from it. Mm -hmm. It's not that they can't be inspired. We've seen that over and over again, obviously. Um, but it's just such a beautiful and affirming experience when someone's writing to you. Yes. Um, I'm like, oh, that must be what white privilege must feel like. Right. <laughs> um, and then it really, I don't think he really did a lot of explaining around it, didn't do a lot of, but just really writing, you know, in this, from this, dare I say, unapologetically black sort of way it was, it was amazing. Um, that inspired, <laughs> that, that alone, and remembering that, um, because that is so incredibly true. Like writing to us, about us, for mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. um, is all of what we're talking about here. Because now we're able to, in 2018, continue to celebrate this amazing work um, and a large body of work in a diverse yeah. amount of publications. Um, and we're still salivating over that. And he was writing to us and for us and about us. Mm. You know, and I, th I think that there might be people that feel like, oh, poetry is not really for me, or, mm. you know, I don't really. At, at Essex Hemphill, I think, I think there's something, <clears throat> something when you read poets that are writing for you. In yes. A sense. Like, I think a lot of us are abused very early on in school with literature, with poetry. It's like a punishment almost. Yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and you're reading these, and it, oftentimes in this very apolitical way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't really recognize that I had an affinity for poetry until I started reading Essex and Like, I never considered myself someone that really read poetry or that really thought about poetry. But then I started reading his words and I was like, oh, I get what it, I get how amazing it can be when someone's able to combine beautiful words with these powerful messages mm -hmm. that really speak to our experiences. Like I get what that's like. And to just be affirmed, mm -hmm. to be affirmed in the, in the, in the poetry. It's incredible. And being able to use that to, um, so I came to, when we talk about reading poetry that is speaking to you and in particular Essex, because um, it's through Essex then that I go on to discover other things and be able mm -hmm. to read other. So Elin Harris, for example, came, you know, after Essex. So I was able to then be able to take in these other works by other Black gay men. Mm -hmm. um, so when you begin to, to read something that affirms you and is about you, um, it just makes you want to crave more and go and search for it. And then it gives you the language to be able to talk about mm -hmm. your life and what you're experiencing in a way that you may not have been able to before. I know it did that for me. And it started with poetry. Wow. Yes, and I mean, I certainly feel like, yeah, I mean, there's just, there's this something so powerful about using art. I mean, what am I getting at? As Black gay men in our journey, we're not often, we don't, there aren't like endless opportunities for healthy identity development. And I think that's why art and culture is so important for us because it helps that process of identity development, of developing a, a, a strong and and loving sense of self. Yes. And that's and that's just a part of the key that that many of us just haven't really um, explored enough. 
Um, Kevin Tarver says, I feel it was a call to black love. The desire of, for connection was real and deep. It was a call for outward expression through art and sex. I speak, uh, it spoke to the desire for affirmation. Black men need to be affirmed more, especially now. Oof. Yeah. Um, Jer says, there's a difference in creating community, no social media, email, et cetera, that we have now to connect. So it had to be done in person or by mail. When I read passages from anthologies, I'm amazed because at that commitment, it must have taken to get it done. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, I can imagine what it's like trying to edit an anthology, like, for example, In the mm-hmm. Life or <laughs> Brother to Brother without email. Absolutely. I'm like, how do you, like, correspond with contributors? Right. And I mean, I can't even, I mean, having, you know, my experience with Blackie Genius, like, I just literally, I can't even imagine what it's like to have to <laughs> deal with all these contributors and not have. So, yeah, it was, but, it, but you create community around it. Mm-hmm. It's like, you have to get, pick up the phone. Right. You have to, like, I mean, it really takes commitment. Um, one of the things, and, and Maurice, you're so welcome. Maurice on um, Facebook on uh, Facebook said, um, you know, thank us for curating this presentation and and thank you. Um, so thank you for watching and being part of this discussion because that is one of the things when, because when you really sit back and you think about all of these works, so everything that we have written on this table, at least these, these four, snail mail, like snail mail folks mm, like yeah. there was and it took years to curate you mm-hmm. know these things and um holding holding that this is why these works are sacred because um these brothers and Essex and and Joseph and they saw that they saw that this was necessary yes. and um for all of us in this moment um i think it's important for us to take um these conversations with ourselves seriously um, and treat them with the care that they deserve. And I'm glad there's so many, so many folks out there who are just doing amazing work now um, that uh, we'll be reading for, uh, for the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. I remember another story about when I worked at Aid Atlanta, I would, I had this whiteboard (laughs) by my cubicle and I would just write these essays and fill quotes on my whiteboard every day because it really connected me to why I was there. So I ran a Black Gay Men's HIV prevention program called Deeper Love, as I shared before. And I was like, I need to be reminded every time I come to this office, every time I'm sitting at my chair, why I'm here today and the shoulders that I stand on, the tradition. Because I mean, ultimately, I felt and I still very much feel that I'm accountable not only to the community of Black gay men that we serve, but also committed to, I'm also accountable to the Black gay men that came before us. Right. The Black gay men that made it possible for us to be able to have these spaces, mm-hmm. like Essex and Phil. And so feeling very much like standing in that tradition and really wanting to essentially pay it forward, mm-hmm. right? That they paved this way for me, like Essex and Phil's bravery and courage. And I mean, because it's like 1986 and he's writing about being a Black gay man, like, in the, <laughs> you, know, in the, you know, conservative regime. Right. Uh, you know, the culture wars and Reagan mm-hmm. and all this stuff, Thatcher, and he's writing about being a black gay man and, and sex and yes. you know, all these things. The the amount, the, the courage that required in that period, <laughs> when there was nothing that said that you would be that your um, efforts would be, you know, would have any kind of like benefit or value, right. like he did it anyway. Yep. And that was what I carried with me to the work that I pretty much every job I've had as mm-hmm. an adult, like I've pretty I've carried that with me, like that this is. I'm accountable to the to, to these men and women, mm-hmm. and I'm accountable to Essex Simple, especially because you know he made it possible for me to be here. Him and so many others. Mm-hmm. There is um, something that in in you saying that and going um, back to mm-hmm. a few of the pieces of Essex and Brother to Brother. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're sitting here discussing how these words, you know, fed us and nurtured us and pushed us forward. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine how hard it was for him. Because you have to get to a point mm. where writing these words couldn't have been easy mm. to write. Mm. Um, but he did it anyway. And the reason why I'm, 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 I'm imagining that it wasn't always true is because we know that even now, even when we have the support, even when we have the funding, even when we have the things, it's like you're still freaked out and scared. Yeah. And you have to, and you and you find that strength mm-hmm. to push forward. Yeah. At least we we try, right? Yeah. Um. So it is important, and, and so this goes into kind of making sure that we check in on our on our warriors. Yes. 
we have to check in on our David warriors. Melbrand spoke on that last mm-hmm. week in Revolutionary Health. Yep. Yeah. We check have to do it because um, they are out here, you know, we're out here doing this, um, this work. <laughs> and um, maybe it's hard sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my dad reads my Facebook. Wow. You know, and there was one day, this was, this was, um, this was amazing, but, um, national coming out day, um, which I don't normally do a thing around, but I did. and I put okay. up a post and my dad reposted it. Oh, wow. And y'all, I promise <laughs> you, I was freaked out and relieved at the same time. <laughs> I think this experience of also us being freaked out and relieved. At the yeah. Same time. I love it. I love it. Um, so I'm sure there were many moments in Essex's <laughs> life where he was freaked out and, and relieved. relieved. So if you're freaked out and relieved right now, Keep you're doing going. something right. You're Keep doing going. something right. <laughs> um, Michael Ward said, realizing the basic need of wanting to be loved and desired, also being okay if it's sex, just out of lust or a primal need of a release. Also delving into issues of sex with men who haven't affirmed their own sexuality and isn't, isn't it funny? Mm-hmm. Oh yes, isn't it funny? Yeah. In this response to the question I asked about, what are your thoughts about how him feel? Talk about sexuality and desire in his work. Kevin Tarver um, responds to, uh, I asked, uh, the question we asked on, on Twitter was, him feel like Joseph Bean was deeply inspired by the work of uh, Black lesbian feminists such as Audre Lorde. What can Black gay men take away from the influence of Black lesbian feminism on Black cultural activism? And Kevin Tarver responded, those friendships are necessary because it's easy to feel lonely and isolated. You give so much, you affirm so many people, but you tend to find yourself in a shell. Mm -hmm. You need strong friendships to help you out of those dark places. Mm -hmm. Um, Absolutely. Um, You know, our friends, for many of us, is like our chosen family. Yep. And we share so much with our friends. We spend so much time. Um, And I, I also think it's something that also requires an incredible amount of work. You know, yes. um, we think about the work that's required in a romantic relationship and, and go on and on. Right. But, you know, our friendships also require work and mm-hmm. labor. Um, and I, I, like I recall reading some of the letters between Essex and Phil and Josephine, Josephine. Mm-hmm. and just the beauty and magic of, of their interactions and how, you know, uh, for me, I mean, other folks can like maybe disagree, but the way Joseph Bean shows up in his anthology in the life, it powerful, yes. angry at times, um, vulnerable in some parts. But in his letters, the way he showed his letters to Essex Hemphill, mm-hmm. I was so inspired just by the way that he shared and the things that he shared. I mean, he the, the vulnerability was sometimes unbearable to to witness mm-hmm. through the letters, but also um, just beautiful and stunning to watch these two black gay men, these warriors check mm-hmm. on each other right. and open up and, and, you know, that takes so much from that. But yes, friendship is such an important force in our lives. Um, you know, I always say I, <laughs> I, I definitely have grieved mm-hmm. uh, friendships that didn't work right. um, as much as, you know, some of our romantic relationships. <laughs> um, Michael says, Think about no internet. These men were groundbreaking in writing down their innermost thoughts mm-hmm. for us to find work that Black gay boys can identify with for years to come. They laid a foundation for men to build communities across state lines. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, in one of the so Mark, um, in response to the question um, around Essex and sexuality on Twitter. Um, He said, listen, I'm not going to lie. Essex takes me there when he talks about sexuality and desire. It's so unapologetic, so raw, so fearless. This is why pieces like Le Salon and Where Seed Falls strike a chord for me because they don't shy away from being graphically real. He goes on to say, Essex's works convey my own feelings about sexuality and desire in an articulate way that I wish I could achieve on my own. In fact, he helped me deviate from what I want and what I don't want when it comes to men in general. Mm. Wow. wow. That is incredible. Yeah. Kevin Tarver, I guess in reference to what I was sharing, I still remember Joseph's letters about how lonely he felt. That's a legit fear of mine as I continue doing the work that I do. 
The loneliness is real. A few weeks ago, I found myself finally crying to a good friend about my journey. It was freeing to cry with another brother. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, so many of us, I think, experience loneliness mm -hmm. and isolation. Those of us, especially do movement work. Yep. You know, I, I don't know. There's something about being a, a black gay creative where mm -hmm. it's like, it's an intense experience. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that it's our friendships that hold us up, that yep. keep us grounded. Um, and they're really affirming that helps, I think, you stay connected because it can be such a journey. <laughs> <laughs> To say the least. <laughs> to say the least, um, you know, it's I can't I echo all of it. Um, friendships and connections are incredibly important. When um, when I think of you know, there are so often being in a creative space, um, you are there's many times because your work gets picked apart. And so often because you're displaying yes. this thing. Um, and if you're an activist, you get picked apart. Oh, right. And you, <laughs> so you're displaying this thing to the world and you've worked so hard to bring it to for people to see. And um, you are hoping that folks love it as much as you love it. Mm. And um, so one of two things happen. <laughs> you um, you share and you just don't read anything. <laughs> you just get it out there. You just don't look back. Right. Or you um, you share and you look back and um, you try and you try and just keep going. So mm -hmm. you take in the information and and possibly use it the next time, or mm -hmm. you know, take what you can get and, and, yep. and move on. But um, it's through friendships and being able to talk to people. Um, so I'm able to talk to Charles uh -huh. and able to talk to other folks in my life. Um, that remind me to keep going mm -hmm. um, despite. Um, and yes, it does get hard, but, um, you know, going back, picking up these books, y'all. So Charles knows this. So I've been in like straight research mode <laughs> for like two weeks and um, going back to words I've read before, picking up new words. I had never read Tongues Untied before. Um, of course, it seemed the film, but it, it wasn't familiar with the book. Many of the works I, I was familiar with individually from other places, but going back to stuff like this, um, talking with Charles, talking with other folks in my life reminds me that um, we have to keep doing the work because it does make a difference. Um, but it's folks like Essex and uh, what they gave to the world that kind of reminds me of that. I also think that there's something rewarding about having friendships where you can bond around art, Ooh. where you can bond around culture. Yes. Like some of the best conversations and most intense friendships I've had have been where we were able to bond around um, our affinity for Essex and Phil. Yeah. Like it's almost like, it was some way, like when you meet somebody and they mm -hmm. reference Essex or they know who that is, it's right. like, oh, we need to be friends. It's like your, your eyes open up. <laughs> so I think I find that, you know, it can also be an amazing bonding mm -hmm. or, you know, like, yeah, I always, I mean, I never get, I'm never not tickled and amazed and just in awe when I meet people that love Essex and Phil's work as much as I do. Right. <clears throat> I see a lot of folks are celebrating Essex yeah. on social media. That's good. I'm not going to be mad. They're not using the happy birthday Essex. Right. Uh, hashtag, <laughs> but it's fine. It's fine. I just wanted to hope we can create community. This isn't, you know. Um, Michael says, uh, friendships are essential in this community because no man is an island. Friends have taught me the joy of vulnerability, trust, and communication with Black gay men like I've never experienced before. Why do you think vulnerability is so important for Black gay men? I feel like it's something that comes up a lot. Um, for me, it, interestingly enough, I was having this conversation uh, <laughs> with someone earlier today. Uh -huh. um, being not being able to be vulnerable was seen as um, a, a sign of like masculinity. Mm. Um, and um, <laughs> I internalized that, you know, from the time I was a child up until the point that I discovered folks like Essex. So when mm. I'm like 20 and 21, I'm trying to now unlearn these walls. And I mean, it, it continues, right? Mm -hmm. So I think vulnerability is important for us because, um, there is so much that we 
deal with externally, but also we internalize and that we have internalized and take and, and taken in that um, being able to sit and really talk and really be honest with one another is incredibly important to be able to move forward and really walk in our power. Mm. Um, but it's pra- it's practice, though. I'm going to use a Tony Michelle Williams thing. It's a, a Tony Michelle <laughs> Williams uh, statement. It's about practice. Like I have to keep practicing it. Um, mm-hmm. And every time that I recognize that I am not being earnest mm-hmm. in, or I'm just kind of giving you a surface response, mm-hmm. I ha- I I have to check myself. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, now mm-hmm. I also recognize that not everybody. Not everybody can get my vulnerability because mm-hmm. I can't. I can't do that with everybody. It's too much. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it's somebody that matters, when it's somebody that you know is in my life and that I really need to be, mm-hmm. I have to check myself and let that down. Wow. But it's wow. it's practice. <laughs> I'm still learning. <laughs> uh, so to the question of uh, one of the questions we asked was. Um, one of the greatest artistic collaborations between Black gay men was the film Songs and Todd. Hemp was poetry, along with writings by Joe Beam, among others, uh, was prominently featured in the Marlon Riggs masterpiece, Reflect on Songs and Todd. And Jared shares, that film was a total shift, a uh, change for me. Wasn't out when I saw it, but it was incredible to see men who looked like me in it. I saw Blackberry, who is in a film this past Friday. I, I, I always tell him how seeing him do the Medusa snap Changed my life. Art would use this now. Yes. <laughs> um, I like. I like. I'm always been a fan of the Z formation snap. Yes. The Z formation snap. I don't know if that was that wasn't in Tongues and Tide. I don't think they did the Z formation snap. I'm trying to remember. That was uh, innovated by the, the uh, in living color. Film. Yeah, men in film. <laughs> you know. Oh boy. <laughs> um, you know, there was a, a a Joe on Twitter. Um, going back to um, uh, HIV advocates and and Essex and Phil. Um, Joe said, what HIV advocates can take away from SS's work is to not allow HIV, not allow HIV to shame us, not allow HIV to shame us for having our desires. Mm. That we can be unapologetic in our sex positivity and right to express ourselves in our fullness, for, uh, which for me includes being a sexual being. Wow. I love yes. it. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I would do a Z formation snap, but I don't think I can do that. Can't blow. It, takes, <laughs> right. it takes years of training. It takes years mastery. of training. It's not anything to play with. <laughs> um, Mr. Lando on Twitter says, uh, and this is a response to, again, how did you discover Essex? He says, I think I first heard about him when I went to Youth Pride in Atlanta. What? You went to Youth Pride in Atlanta? Yes. Um, which was more years ago than I care to admit. <laughs> you. <laughs> youth Pride. Um, wait, I wonder if I was a part of that. You heard about Essex and Full of Youth Pride. I wonder if I was involved in that. At you all. probably were. <laughs> that sounds like a Charles thing. <laughs> <laughs> like 18 year old Charles went around with a little Essex and uh, ceremonies, <laughs> uh, brother to brother, like terrorizing the, pe- the right. poor people. <laughs> As a queer, as a as a queer youth, <laughs> um, Renice, thank you, for, thank you for doing this. I still need my hood. <laughs> I you were Y'all are gonna leave us alone about the hoodies. We love you. I am so we ran out. I we promise you. Um, yeah, join our email list though. Be in the loop. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you, Bernice, Bernice Lee McFarlane. That's awesome. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. Um, what else is going on on Twitter? Let's check the Twitter. Uh-huh. Check the Twitter. You know, oh, one of the things I want to shout out to, um, you can find this. I discovered this. I didn't even mm-hmm. know. So, of course, the internet is a magical place. It is a magical place. YouTube is a magical place where you can find um, these audio recordings of Essex on stage. Oh yeah, did you? I know I shared on Facebook the um the one about the bombing. Well, yes, and I, I had seen it. Uh-huh. I had I had I had discovered so in my in my two weeks of research I was <laughs> I had or I had discovered it, and <clears throat> I was like, oh my god, um because of course I'm familiar with you know seeing Essex and you know especially the work in in um, uh, Tongues Untied as well as Anthem and you know 
Um, by the way, shout out for Anthem too. We don't talk about Anthem a lot, but you know, it was Marlon Riggs had so the, during the Tongues Untied period, like Anthem was like one of those cuts mm -hmm. in Tongues Untied. So it's like a seven minute performance piece where Marlon uh, Marlon is dancing, but the end um, includes um, American Wedding from Essex Hemphill. Um and Essex is in there kind of doing that piece. And um uh but uh it is, hold on one second, I'm trying to refresh now. Um, okay, uh, no, <laughs> um, it is really key to, to kind of revisit. Um, so looking on YouTube, search for Essex and Phil, um, because you can um, listen to Essex perform um, some collaborative pieces as well as some individual works. So Jerry has a comment on Twitter, um, and this is response to my question. Um, or the final question uh, on the Twitter chat was the disproportionate impact of HIV on our community persists. What role does poetry have in public health? You know, I'm all about like, poetry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jer uh, comments, poetry and other artistic expressions are essential to touching the spirit. Mm -hmm. We may not remember all the details, data, information from a conference on HIV, but how the words of an artist makes us think and feel lingers in us. Absolutely. Thank you for that. That is also, um, couldn't agree more. Could not agree more. We remember language, we remember words, we remember stories. We remember things that um, make us feel. Remember Certainly. things that make us feel. Absolutely. Because um, I will tell you that oftentimes, um, this has happened with Essex a lot, mm -hmm. um, where you will remember, you may not remember the whole poem, but you remember a piece. And you're like, I can find that piece <laughs> if, if I pick this book up. Um, so uh, it matters in all of our work. Oh, Joe has some great comments. Um, the way Essex talked about sexuality and desire was real life. He didn't shy away from, as the church folks say, <laughs> telling it like it is. I think that is what makes his work powerful, being honest and truthful about the totality of our experiences. Absolutely, Joe. Absolutely. Give him a retweet. Um, that, is why, that is what allows us to identify with him on a deep level because it shows us in our fullness. I think this part of his work gives us permission to lay claim to that part of ourselves that is still so stigmatized within and outside our community. Absolutely. You know, and I've been telling, you know, folks that work in aid service organizations, I was like, you know, <laughs> it I I get that it's a bit of a stretch, but if you're gonna work with black gay men, you need to know something about the community and culture. Absolutely. You know, and not just stuff you see on YouTube. No, you mm -hmm. need to know something about the the history and culture of the people and community you're working with. Um mm -hmm. Period. And I think Essex Simple is a starting point for so much of that. Absolutely. And um, in piggybacking on that, there are um, there are folks um, who are doing great work in the um, kind of in the tradition of Essex Hemphill. And it's really just kind of uh, seeking out um, those folks. And, and you know what? Finding what really drives and what really makes you feel something mm. and sh share that with someone. So if I would leave us with anything, um, you know, when I discovered Essex, mm -hmm. clearly I shared it because yeah. a friend of mine remembered mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I know that they shared it with someone else. Um, so when you discover something that feeds you and that um, gives you something that you need and you know it can help someone else, yes. share it. Share it, share it, share it. Well, this has been quite an event. Yes. <laughs> All right, y'all. If you're watching this on Facebook, please like, um, well, please follow us on Facebook and also like this video. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please, please, please. Mm -hmm. um, and also like us on YouTube as well. Finally, um, follow us on Twitter at Building Desire and join our email list. You can join our email list by going to thecounternarrative.org. Mm -hmm. we, should have we should have done it together. Right. We can do it now. <laughs> Maybe One, next time. Two, no, three. I don't want to do yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, again, I'm just, we're so grateful to, to just share the space with you. Again, happy Essex. I've been calling it happy Essex Day. Happy Essex Day. I've been saying happy birthday. Yeah. Let's figure that okay. out. Mm -hmm. um, That's the thing. But all right, y'all. Thank you so much for doing this with us. And until next, well, actually tomorrow, <laughs> Tomorrow, we're going to be on Revolutionary Health. So yes, so check us out here. tomorrow at 7 o'clock. Yep. Tuesday, 7 o'clock on our Facebook. Check us out on Revolutionary Health. Absolutely. And um, before I before we end, 
Um, love you too, Kevin. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, we miss you too. So like have a that. great, great evening, everyone. And um, be here tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Revolutionary Help with Charles Stevens <laughs> and Dr. David Malbranch.